Hello everyone, this is Sierra Hatfield, Policy Analyst at the Council of State Government Headquarters here in Lexington, Kentucky, and I staff the Intervention to Save Lives Subcommittee of CSG's Healthy States National Task Force. One of the policy areas the subcommittee has identified is disease and management systems with a special interest on bloodborne diseases such as hepatitis C. And one of the practices we've identified in the research as a potential best practice for states to consider is a revamp of testing and treatment options. But what would an attainable, successful revamp look like? I'm talking today, today with Deanne Gruber, Director of the Bureau of Infectious Diseases at the Louisiana Department of Health, whose department may have figured out the answer. So Deanne, what I'd like you to do is tell us the story of this new hep C treatment plan in Louisiana kind of how did it start, where it's going, and most importantly, how it's been saving lives. So if that sounds good to you, I'll go ahead and let you take it away. Thank you, Sierra, and, and I, I um, really am appreciative of, of CSG reaching out and, and inviting me to participate on this webinar and to share uh, some stories from the state of Louisiana as over the last several years we've We've really tackled the state health department, along with the support of the governor, um, has, has taken on the, the charge of how can we eliminate hepatitis C uh, in Louisiana in a five-year period. And knowing that that's a really, really lofty goal, um, we felt that that was basically our moonshot. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow that from our assistant secretary at the Office of Public Health, Dr. Alexander Biu, um, where we do see this as being a moonshot. Um, but we are very committed and, and uh, uh, working hard to ensure that, that we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're going to reach that. Um, and so the, what, we're ha what's, what has happened in Louisiana is that basically we have, we have seen over a number of years um, a continued increase in the number of people who, were, uh, who are being diagnosed with hepatitis B infection. And, um, and Particularly over the last number of years, we've seen significant spike in, in that number. Um, and for example, for our, over a 10 year period from 2009 to 2018, more than 44,000 individuals in Louisiana have been diagnosed with chronic hepatitis C. Um, but when we back that up and we, we look at just a piece of, of that 10 year span, and we really just look at the last three years of 2016 to 2018, um, that 50, over 50% 50 of those diagnoses were, were identified during the last three years. And so if you can imagine, for a while there, you know, we were averaging approximately, you know, perhaps 3,000 individuals a year, and then all of a sudden the last three years, uh, we, um, it, it spiked dramatically. And, and we know that that's for a number of different, different reasons. Um, first of all, and most significantly, it coincides with the opioid epidemic that uh, certainly every jurisdiction in the state is, is experiencing, and, and uh, Louisiana is, is, is certainly one of those states as well. And so we've seen uh, the number of individuals who are being identified uh, with hepatitis C primarily because of injection drug use. And, and in fact, in, in our state, um, we estimate that more than 112,000 individuals are at very high risk of acquiring hepatitis C uh, through injection drug use. I think the other thing that we have seen that, that really caught our attention with our, with our data and surveillance was um, these changes in demographics of, of individuals who are being newly diagnosed with hepatitis C and what their age range, uh, age ranges is and, um, and gender. And for, you know, a number of years, this really, this epidemic really has, um, has impacted the baby boomer generation or those individuals who were born between 1945 and 1965. Um, and, but over the last 12 years or so, we've started to see that change where we are not only seeing uh, individuals who are in that age range of the older population, but also individuals who are younger. And, and, and in fact, uh, those, those two groups are starting to kind of parallel one, num one another as far as the number of diagnoses. And so, and again, we also acknowledge that this in many ways is related to the opioid epidemic. So, you know, what we, what we, when we were continuing to look at these numbers and um, 
our health secretary four years ago, um, when we also looked at the number of people who were able to access hepatitis C treatment, particularly those who were enrolled in Medicaid, those numbers were very, very small. And, and so our health secretary basically said, uh, Dr. Gee said, you know, we're going to then make this a high, high priority. And, and again, what, what we find are what we call big bets uh, in our state of, uh, and seeing that, that one of the primary reasons why individuals could not access hepatitis C treatment was because of the high, high cost of drug prices. Um, and, and really it being unaffordable for, for many individuals to be able to, to be treated. Our state Medicaid program um, had put restrictions on, on who could be approved for treatment and, and those, and that in many ways was, you know, in order, based on the resources that we had available in Medicaid, um, we then had to look at um, individuals who needed the treatment the most. But of course, that also meant it was individuals who were, um, who had progressed to advanced disease stages um, and, and also that there were restrictions related to providers of who could, uh, who could treat individuals. And so we then again said, well, let's try to figure out a way that we can decrease these drug prices so that with the resources we have, that we're going to be able to increase access for people who are living with this, with, with this disease that if it's untreated, it definitely can lead to, uh, to mortality. So we, we pursued this in a very comprehensive, uh, very collaborative and systematic approach so that we could achieve statewide elimination of hepatitis C infection. And one of the key things that we did is uh, last year, we contracted with a pharmaceutical company and entered into a modified subscription plan for unlimited access to HCV treatment. And, and this is for people who are enrolled in Medicaid as well as persons who are incarcerated in one of eight state correctional facilities at this time. So with that, and I guess, you know, saying a few words about, you know, the, the, the subscription model, which we see as being a game changer, is that, you know, we are approaching this where we pay an annual fixed fee uh, to the pharmaceutical company with this contract, and then basically the manufacturer provides unlimited access to the medication. And, and our goal is to treat 10,000 people uh, in Louisiana who are enrolled in Medicaid or under the custody of the Department of Corrections by the end of 2020. And by the end of 2024, we want to treat 80% of persons diagnosed with hepatitis C in Louisiana. So is that what modified prescription means? Is it something that um, states can negotiate? Or is, like you said, you pay a fixed fee. Is that what a modified prescription is? Yes. So it is then. A, and in fact, what we did was um, we entered into this agreement. And, and I guess I can share a little bit about how we, how we went about of even um, negotiating a contract with a pharmaceutical company. Um, when, for, for a couple of years in 2016 through 2018, um, health officials and, and other key individuals within uh, Louisiana, we really looked at every avenue to say, how can we address drug pricing? And, um, and there were various strategies that were considered, such as even going to, um, Going to a, a, an extreme of even looking at, you know, is it possible to break a patent? Um, uh, the federal government has that has that chance to do that, but we but we then decided let's look at other options in order to say uh, in order to see what what is what is feasible. And so with this modified subscription model, it was then of um, we we developed and we released uh, solicitation for offers. Uh, which is, you know, similar to a request for proposals, but a solicitation for offers uh, from any of the pharmaceutical companies that are currently manufacturing HCV treatment. And, and in exchange for um, a set amount of funding that we would give to them, 
each year for five years, they would then basically give us unlimited access to their drug. And so we released this uh, solicitation for offers a year ago in January. We, we received applications from each of the three pharmaceutical companies uh, that currently provide HCV treatment. And, um, and then we went through and basically did an extensive review process of these applications. And then um, based on what we thought was, you know, the, the highest scoring application, we then, we, we announced the winner and that was a Segwa Therapeutics, which is a subsidiary of Gilead. And they manufacture generic Abclusa. And so that is then the, the medication or the drug that we are then offering for people enrolled in Medicaid, as well as those who are in Department of Corrections. Um, and we see this, you know, as, uh, as, a, as a way, you know, we really are seeing this as, as a win-win-win formula uh, with this modified subscription model. You know, by entering into this contract, um, it's a win for the state because we not only have uh, predictable costs, you know, we know that this is the amount of money that is earmarked or allocated every year in order to then treat people living with um, hepatitis C. We also, it's a win for us because we then can see a dramatic increase in access to treatment for people in Medicaid and DOC or Department of Corrections. And it really does enable us to have these mass treatment efforts. Uh, so it, it really, you know, is seeing versus individual by individual who needs treatment and may have to go through a lot of prior approvals or other kinds of things that we had. Instead, we really are opening this up um, in, a, in a significantly mass way. We also see it's a win for the manufacturer, and that's because they now have pre predictable revenue. They know that they're going to be getting this amount of money from the state of Louisiana. They also, by doing this, um, have the opportunity to have a gain in market share because, because we know that the individuals who are going to be treated, if they're enrolled in Medicaid, the first line of treatment is going to be Abclusa from a Segwa. And so they're gaining that market share versus having providers who may then look at a variety of different medications and, and select uh, one over the other. And then, then this also gives them an opportunity to potentially spill over into other markets. So it may not just be for HCV drugs that, that their company may be uh, prescribed, but the provider may decide to prescribe other, other medications that are coming from this company. And then the third win is obviously for the patient, where you know, this patient now has increased access to treatment. Um, you know, we have heard many, many stories since, since this has started uh, from individuals, you know, who have been living with hepatitis C, but have been denied treatment or could not afford treatment. Their health insurance plan maybe didn't cover treatment, um, but now this is something that they have been able to now enroll in. And, and this, this treatment is a 12-week treatment period. So from day one to, to, to the end of the 12th week, that individual then has um, a greater than 95% chance of being cured. It has a very, very high uh, cure rate. And so, so they have this increased access to treatment. They also, you know, they themselves are going to experience uh, reduced cost because if they have hepatitis C treated now, um, and then they, it doesn't have to be these long-standing kind of out-of-pocket out co-pays or deductibles or other kinds of, of costs that, that may be related, uh, they may be co comorbidities that are occurring because they're diagnosed with hepatitis C, and so they also then need to have treatment for those other comorbidities. And obviously then we're seeing, you know, with this, it's reduced morbidity and mortality because of it. So are people, well, are patients uh, actually taking advantage of having this increased access to treatment? Absolutely, and in fact, um, we have seen, um, and, and I, I want to kind of set this up a little bit about giving some information of like how many individuals have been treated for hepatitis C who were enrolled in Medicaid in previous years, and this is really like before we launched this program. Um, 
And, and so I pulled up some, some previous data, and if you think about 12-month periods going from July through June of every year, um, from July 2016 to June 2017, 493 individuals with HCV enrolled in Medicaid were treated. The next year of 2017-2018, it was then just under 800. There were 796 people. The third year, 2018-2019, it was 1,225. So the most individuals that we've been able to treat in a 12-month period was 1,225 individuals, and that, again, was from July 2018 to June 2019. Since we launched this modified subscription model on July 15, 2019, in a six-and-a-half-month time period, we have had over 3,163 individuals treated in Medicaid, and we've had 200 persons treated in Department of Corrections. The thing with Department of Corrections is that we just started that on January 1st. So that's for a two-month time period of 200 individuals. But that, but that bigger focus of six and a half months of 3,000 people enrolled in Medicaid were treated for HCV. And I think that the other thing that we look at are some of the, um, we also are, are you know, affecting how many people have, um, have completed that treatment of that 12, that 12 week treatment period. And so out of the over 3,100 individuals, we have over 2,100 individuals who have successfully completed the entire treatment regimen. Obviously we have a number of people who are in the middle of that 12 week period. Um, and then I think the other thing that is really exciting is seeing um, the, you know, this is a strong partnership and relationship with, uh, with our clinical providers throughout the state. And, and the fact that in that six and a half month time period, through our Medicaid claims data, we've identified that over 190 clinicians have prescribed um, HCV treatment for the very first time for their patients. And, and so we then are seeing that as, you know, clinicians are feeling more comfortable in treating hepatitis C. This is a very easy, simplified uh, treatment regimen. And, and we've also created an algorithm that has made this much more uh, simple for clinicians to be able to do this. And I think that previously there was always the consideration that even if somebody was diagnosed with hepatitis C, is there, is there a clinician within my city or town or area that um, has been, you know, like a, a, either a specialist or, you know, an infectious disease physician or a gastroenterologist um, compared to a primary care provider or an internal, in, uh, internal medicine physician? Well, at this point, because of the change in medication and also because of a, uh, a simplified treatment algorithm that has been created here in Louisiana um, that, that more, more providers are feeling comfortable and I am able to then access treatment uh, and not have to, you know, wait on a, a waiting list to get into an infectious disease doc or something like that. Right, right. Well, I think based on everything that you've said, you know, this sounds like something uh, well, let me ask, would you, uh, with your experience with this new modified subscription plan and kind of like seeing the numbers before and after and actually having some tangible results so early on, would you kind of recommend that states look into kind of like that direct negotiation with um, healthcare providers as a possible practice for handling of other bloodborne diseases in their states? I, I think that it, it definitely is something, uh, that, yes, that I would recommend for uh, state health officials, legislators, you know, to, you know, um, uh, individuals who, you know, who are responsible for, for running Medicaid programs and, and other health plans in their, in their state to definitely uh, see this as an option. And, and I think that, um, you know, the, 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 the ability to, to increase this access to treatment, again, we really see this as being, um, 
you know, it's something that hasn't been done in the past. And, and you know, and, and yes, it's true that in a, a short period of time of having six and a half months of data at this point to review, you know, the results have been phenomenal of, of how many individuals have now been able to get treatment. And, and I think that, you know, I, I do know that also the state of Washington uh, last year, uh, they, they have also proceeded with, with a, a similar type of model. There's a few little differences uh, here and there, and they also went with a, a different pharmaceutical company. Um, but I think that, you know, they also saw the value of let's, let's try this and, and, and see what we're able to, uh, to accomplish. And, um, you know, obviously financial resources continue to be very limited and, and you know, um, uh, so it, it's a way for, for states to approach this in an innovative fashion and see how, you know, how, how we can pursue this. I think the, I think the, I, I want to share just a few other things about the fact that although the subscription model, the modified subscription model is kind of like the, a really big gold star in this strategy, um, we also have to, you know, acknowledge and be sure that individuals know that that's just one piece of this puzzle. And, and you know, we were successful in negotiating the contract, um, but, but the work at that point, and even before we finalized that contract, there was work that was happening and that needs to continue to happen in other areas um, in order to really take advantage of this, uh, of this contract that has been negotiated. Um, the thing about the subscription model is, you know, whether we have you know, 5,000 people treated or 500 people treated in one year, we're going to pay the same amount. And so that's the thing is that, you know, we have to then make sure that people in the community are aware uh, and have increased awareness around hepatitis C, around the risk of hepatitis C, and to be sure that they can then get screened and tested and if they're, and if they're diagnosed, that they then are able to access treatment. We also then have focused on these providers and training, going through a really um, uh, a number of different training uh, opportunities for clinicians so that once again, if somebody is diagnosed, uh, there, we have more providers who then can be available to treat, uh, to treat these patients. And, and so we've, we've, we're, we've worked with some um, you know, nationally known hepatologists and, and other clinicians to make sure that we have uh, really strong provider outreach training opportunities that are um, you know, hopefully easy for them to, to access, to have ongoing consultation around patient cases, et cetera. Um, and then the other thing is that we also know there's a need for, um, for, um, for really expanded um, or implementing complementary treatment strategies. And this includes um, efforts around harm reduction and syringe service programs for people who inject drugs. Um, we need treatment for opioid use disorder, including medication-assisted therapy. And, and in Louisiana, uh, three years ago, we actually were able to change our state law uh, to allow a legal operation of syringe service programs. And, and, and that was really critical you know, to be able to, again, approach this in a comprehensive and complementary treatment um, uh, approach so, so that we, we are able to now operate syringe service programs um, as long as the local jurisdiction or local authority has also approved of this. And at this point, City of New Orleans, City of Baton Rouge, City of Alexandria, and the City of Shreveport have all now uh, approved past ordinances to, to allow syringe service programs. And like that, we see that as an important strategy in, in this puzzle uh, because it not only then provides, you know, uh, uh, provides uh, needles and syringes in order to avoid the transmission of infectious diseases, including HCV and HIV, but we also see syringe service programs as being uh, a gateway for people to be able to receive screening for HIV, HCV, perhaps sexually transmitted infections, hepatitis A, vaccinations for hep A, hep B, um, and also referrals to uh, substance use treatment if they're interested. And so it, it can be a supportive environment uh, and complementary treatment to 
some medical treatment that may also, um, but that's very important. Right, so what you're saying is it all kind of works together. There can't really be a standalone state initiative that's gonna tackle something as big as uh, hep C when you have all this other stuff going on like substance use disorders and all of that. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think, you know, one, one last thing I wanna mention about, you know, these different components within our strategy that I highlighted. Um, you know, the other piece, and I think this is also a, a, a role, you know, really high priority for uh, state officials and legislators, and, and that is related to data. And, and, you know, what data systems do we have in place uh, in order to ensure that we are, you know, capturing uh, information related to people who are being diagnosed with hepatitis C, um, people also, you know, of uh, um, people then who are being enrolled into treatment and that they're successfully completing that treatment and then also knowing that based on test results that they received following the treatment that they have successfully been cured um, and so you know that that is you know those are systems that need a lot of focus and priority to make sure that they're robust that they are you know, they're also, of course, protecting individuals' privacy and, and HIPAA laws. But also, I think one of the things, um, you know, we want to make sure that it's, it's timely, it's complete. You know, it's things that we can do in, in you know, more close, as close to real-time action as we can get. Um, that, that, that's, that's a real challenge. But we don't want to be looking at data that is like a year and a half old and try to then, you know, prioritize or make plans on, what you know what what else do we need to be doing instead we want us to be very current uh data and i think that one thing that that louisiana did last year uh that that could be of interest to legislators and and other state officials is that we changed our sanitary code and our sanitary code you know is basically that document that regulates and mandates you know who needs to report um, various diseases, particularly infectious diseases and other conditions to the state health department so that we can take action around outbreaks, around, you know, what, what, is, what is occurring. Last year, we changed it so that we are now uh, receiving every lab uh, test of, uh, that is related to hepatitis C, HIV, and syphilis. And so we're getting negative test results as well as as, as well as those who have then uh, been diagnosed. And, and what that does for us, uh, it does a number of different things, but one of the biggest things that it does is that it provides us a denominator in the sense of, we know how many people have been diagnosed with an infectious disease, but we don't know how many people have, been, have ever been tested. And so it helps us to identify, are there areas or outreach that we need to be doing in order to encourage additional testing because people may be living with an infectious disease and, and may not be aware of it. So that's one piece that's been really um, is, is helpful. And the other piece is it does give us, you know, if somebody is diagnosed with HCV, obviously their lab results then are showing positive test results. But after they go through treatment, those, those test results are gonna go back to being negative. And so by having that negative test result as a post-treatment follow-up, again, gives us additional valuable information to be assured that treatment is working and, and this individual has now been cured, is not able to transmit this disease to other individuals. Right, right. So in conclusion, y'all have been really busy with this and trying to hit it from all sides, like through legislature, through partnerships, through other outreach, some education, Yes, we have. We've been we've been very very busy, um, and 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 you know are obviously very excited about uh, what you know what we've been able to accomplish in this period of time, um, you know and 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 it, yeah, it, it, just as you said, this is a very very large collective we uh, that it's not just the Office of Public Health Bureau of Infectious Diseases, but it's. It's the entire, um, it, it's all of our community partners, our clinicians, our, uh, our academics who are also working with us around research and 
um, evaluation and, and cost effectiveness studies. Um, you know, it, it's our community providers. It, it, it's uh, it, it, it's a very large umbrella that that we have um, that we have people huddled underneath and uh, and working as as quickly as we can to eliminate HCV in Louisiana. Awesome. So I think I just have one last question. Um, what would you like the subcommittee to know, or is there anything else that hasn't already been said? as we continue the conversation around hepatitis C and what may be uh, the best practice to kind of control it? Yeah, I think obviously, you know, the, the, again, the, the treatment is one piece of that puzzle and figuring out how to get that increased access to treatment is important. Um, but I think, you know, the continued awareness and uh, education that that is needed um, across the board for for people I mean I, I think that uh, HCV is it again I think that certainly we are experiencing significantly increasing numbers of people who are now being diagnosed and I know that we're not the only state and I think that you know making sure that Providers are aware of it, that they are offering testing uh, to their patients, and that, you know, and, and that also, you know, looking at what are, uh, what are the, the, the treatment access points for, uh, for patients. Thank you so much for your time today. I'm so excited to kind of share uh, this innovative practice with the subcommittee and with the rest of our members. Well, thank you so much again. I, I appreciate having the opportunity to share this with uh, with, with you and, and everyone from CSG.